this is Cherie. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. Uh, this is a podcast for women who long to feel expressed and be who they truly are. Today, we're going to talk about the spiritual laws of money and abundance. We've got Gul Khan coming to us from England, talking about her journey from being a 27-year-old successful attorney and millionaire to a broke single mom. Please ask to join the Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group. In a few weeks, we will be doing some really super cool drawings. I'm giving away entrance to my Stand Speak Shine School, a free coaching session, and a few other fun freebies that you can grab. A Facebook Live on November 10th uh, at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. So yeah, lots of cool stuff. And I love just coming into this discussion about wealth and abundance and money. And I've done a couple episodes kind of on like clearing your money story, rewriting your money story, clearing your ancestral money patterns and that kind of thing. Today, Gul Khan is going to share with us how she transformed her mindset and stepped away from the corporate world and into her true work, which in turn massively rebuilt herself and her family. She's an intuitive life coach, a money mindset expert, and she helps empower women to receive unlimited abundance. One of the things that we'll talk about in this episode is that money really isn't the true issue, like the lack of or the abundance of money. It's it's about something deeper. It's about something that lives on the energetic level, especially if you have some kind of fear of charging for your intuitive or spiritual gifts, whatever kind of blocks that you have about receiving. And you can find out more about Gull and some of her offerings on gullcon.com. Gull, I'm so grateful that you're here with us today. You seem like such an interesting person. I'm so glad you reached out to me. Thank you so much for having, for having me, Sherry. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, well, I want to know, I mean, because... I kind of already introduced you to the audience and and your expertise and just the diversity of your career. And I'm just super curious how you bridged from, you know, practicing law, which you still are registered as as a lawyer, um, how you bridged into energy work. (laughs) <laughs> that's a journey <laughs> that's a journey in itself it wasn't intentional I, I promise you that it is never it was never something that I thought that one day I, I want to become an energy healer not at all <laughs> we don't um, grow up I, as little girls saying oh energy yeah I'm gonna go into that <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I suppose somewhere in me there was a healer that always wanted to come out so I've always been nurturing and I have been a natural born healer and, and as a fellow energy healer you you understand that point that you just you're born with that you're born with the ability to heal and the inner you know, need to to heal and help people. So I had that from the beginning, but I was actually, um, I studied to become a lawyer. I'm, you know, academically did well, but even though I'm, I'm dyslexic, I'm severely dyslexic by the way, which I wasn't, um, which wasn't found out until the first year of my law degree. I did uh, my law degree at University of London. And uh, in the end of my first year, I was assessed to be not just dyslexic, but severely dyslexic. And this is mm. after I've achieved great, uh, actually, for, for, by you know normal standard, I, I was an overachiever. So I was like one of the top people at the, you know, at the university and prior to my college because I was a very, very hardworking student. But I think it's just pure through sheer, sheer, sheer hard work. However, that. You know, when I realized that I was dyslexic and, I, and then I looked back and I thought, because I remember, I remember the assessor looking at me thinking, how did you get your grades? I'd buy them had five A-levels and all A's. Um, so it put me on a path to work out, okay, so what? how does my brain work? So that's where my initial journey started. I want, I was interested in, in thinking, okay, so how does neuroscience work and how do neurons work and et cetera, et cetera. That was my, my initial path and journey. So I was learning about mind mapping, speed reading, et cetera. By coincidence or not, Right, because nothing. There's no such thing as coincidence. I actually found. I was looking for a book by Tony Buzan, and I picked up a book by Tony Robbins, and that was Awaken the Giant Within, and that led me on a path which uh, allowed me to literally just work out who I was. So, as I was studying to become a lawyer, and I did become a very successful lawyer. I also, you know, got really interested in, in psychology of success, and you know, NLP, and so you know, mm-hmm. so forth. It really led me down a different path simultaneously. And I was, and you know, I have growing up, so give you a little bit of context of my background. 
I grew up in what would be classified as slums in you know in U US because I grew up in East London. I grew up in um, East London in a, on a council estate, so literally the slums kind of a thing. You know, my, my mother worked in very low paid jobs. We, you know, my brother was always in and out of juvie and you know the normal shebang. So it, for for a child who uh, then also a brown girl child, right? Keep this in mind. I'm a brown girl growing up in East London. You know, everything going against me and being severe fairly dyslexic like I remember now it made sense but when I was younger I didn't realize this I couldn't read I couldn't read a full sentence until I was in high school like 11 12 years old can you imagine that wow and that's where I was from there I went on to do you know by the time I was 18 and I got my A-levels I did five A-levels and I got chemistry biology math and further math from 19 I did really you know the, the sciences and got really high grades so the journey was immense and even I was impressed when I realized like oh okay and so I realized that nothing, but I, I always had the psychology of success and I was trying to really interest in why. I set myself a target of, you know, making, being a millionaire by the time I was, I was 30. I hit that 27. And so I did, I did very, very well. Now, as I, um, as I was, as I was, uh, I'll say, <laughs> as I was going down the rabbit hole, so to speak, in the person development range, you know, you become a person development junkie. As I was going down the rabbit hole, it led me into a different path. NLP was great, but it was very superficial. EFT was great, again, but very, you know, for me, it was just, you know, very basic. And then I got interested in energy healing and energy modalities and so forth. Now, I didn't actually pick energy healing up until I was married and actually took a break from work itself, because that's the only time I actually had enough time to really explore this other psychic side of me. And I was just exploring, learning. I realized not only am I, you know, do I have a natural psychic abilities, I'm actually very good at shifting energy. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I can shift and manipulate energy at a, a very, you know, in quite a large capacity. And I'm more, um, when I say shift energy and manipulate energy, I'm like a catalyst, Sherry. Mm -hmm. So I can shift, uh, you know, I can shift large amounts of energy with very small amount of my energy, if that makes sense. As I, because as you know, catalysts don't need, you don't need too much of a catalyst to actually make a combustion. Right, to, to, for you to have these chemical reactions. That's where I am. And I was able to do this work. But remember, I was doing pro bono for the longest time ever because I had never had any intention of being a coach, working as, in, as this is a career. I was a lawyer and that's all there was to it. There was nothing else around it. And when I was, I was taking a break to have family. And when I was finished, my, you know, when I, my family, when my children had grown up, my idea was to go back into law. However, when I went through, I went through some traumatic time with my, with my husband and I found him he's cheating on me. And by then he, I was completely financially dependent on him. So when he and I separated, I left my husband, of course, and uh, he pulled the financial card on me and I had two young children to financially support, even though I was a millionaire, most of my money was trapped in property. And when we're going through a divorce, I don't know about US, US but in UK, you know, the, the assets are divided equally. So while we're going through a divorce, I couldn't even access my property. Does that make sense? I was really stuck. And because I have a prop, uh, assets, I wasn't allowed welfare either. Right. So I was really stuck between a rock and a hard place. And that's oh, when wow. I decided, I mean, and then also had two young children, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. And I was looking to go back to law. That was an option. Like that was option A. And I thought, and I, I, mean, I come from banking finance line, um, background, but the, I mean, banking finance and corporate law pays very well. I have to say, you know, as, as far as jobs go, they pay very well. However, your time isn't yours anymore. Now, any corporate employee or slave would tell you that, you know, the more you make, the more you commit time-wise to the corporation. And I wasn't willing to do those 80, 90 hours anymore. I had two young children. I thought already, you know, because at the time the father wasn't seeing the kids much. So the kids already don't have their father. They're going to lose a mother too. All they will see is a nanny, right? So that's primary reason why I, I do want to go back into law. Secondly, I think by then I had changed. I learned so much about energy healing and so forth. And I've been doing pre burn work and I was getting results for people, but I wasn't charging at that time. I thought, well, what if I charged? What if I just went in and helped people and I charged money for it? What a novel concept. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's where I started. Actually, you know, I, just to stop you there for a second, I, I feel like that we've, done, we've t talked a little bit on this podcast about the fear that some people have, I would say, particularly women have mm. with commoditizing some of their gifts. Yeah. Um, and that somehow they'll be like selling their soul, if you will, yeah. if they, if they seek to earn an income through the expression of some of their spiritual gifts. Absolutely. And um, so it's interesting that you, 
you didn't, it doesn't sound like you really struggled with that. It was just like, hmm. No, 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 I did. <laughs> oh boy, did I? Did you? <laughs> oh boy, did I. I spent a good, but then I, but I think that the reason why I struggled was, was, you know, was an essential element of my journey because everything I struggled with highlighted my many books. It highlighted my issues and it actually and even the, the my exact life as it happened and i share this i read candidly at other, other podcasts and other places as well i actually manifested my mother's exact life so my mother had left my father who was very very wealthy at a um, similar age to where i was at the moment which is late 30s she had two children i had two children her youngest child was five i was uh, which was me um I, my youngest child was a boy but he was five the 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 man that my father the, the woman that my father married was 16 years younger than my mother. The girl my ex-husband cheated on me was looking to marry was 16 years younger than me. Can you imagine? Right? Uh. So, and at that time, my mother went on welfare because she, she wasn't um, that educated. Well, she was very educated, but she wasn't. She didn't speak English very well, so she wasn't sure how to get a professional job. So she just went into factory working here. Whereas, um, even though I was, you know, highly qualified uh, um, a lawyer and had been used to be, uh, you know, earning six figures in my corporate job, at that particular moment in time, I had no income and no source of um, supply and I was literally for for the couple of months while they were assessing and working out how much property I have I was in welfare for a couple of months so how did I go from earning six figures and being a millionaire before you know before 30 to being at home single mother and on welfare can you imagine mm. so I, I that is my biggest aha moment and so that's that's what led me on my journey to work out before that I was a general energy healer I was interested in, in, in money but it was a general healing you know I can heal everything my full focus went laser sharp on money after that. And I just, I eliminated every single block in my life. Now, this is not that long ago, Sherry. It was only 2017. My first client came to me in November, 2017. So my business would be three years old in November, mm. 2020. Yet we are set to cross, we are, we are a multi six figure company now. And next year we'll definitely, definitely cross seven figures. But over in this year as well, this last, um, and it's not the years in complete, the year will be in November, we are well into multiple six figures. And that's just within three years. So that's once crazy. you eliminate money, it is, it is. I love, well, I love, I'm very like business minded and I love to hear women have success stories like that. <laughs> like you just took us through that whole story arc of like, yep, I was super successful. I was single, you know, I was a single woman. I was making all this money. Then I crashed Then I hit bottom and here I am on the way. Like, it's just like, <laughs> take it, us on that roller journey. coaster. Yeah, it is. And it's a journey. And, but it doesn't, my point is it doesn't take, once you've identified your money blocks, once you've identified what's holding you back and what, what is that you're creating? And I always say, when you take personal responsibility for everything that's showing up in your life it's very easy to turn the tables because if you can create if you can create all the mess that you're dealing with at the moment you can create the opposite also it's right. all about creating the emotional memory but you can only create the emotional memory of what you desire is once you have removed all the blocks and this is the missing key mm -hmm. it really is all about what's happening on the energetic and thought level exactly if that's that's to me that's like the spiritual creation piece you know before you can manifest people are always saying how do you you know release your money blocks whatever it's like well if you really want to make physical money like if you want something in your bank account if you want to create something like money if you want that flow to happen then you need flow in your body you need yeah. flow in the way you think there's a direct connection or marriage between those two so and I know this is like your area of expertise, so I'm totally, I'm totally preaching the <laughs> choir here. But I love um, that you've had this journey because we teach a lot about the heroine's journey in this mm -hmm. podcast. And I ask every single person I interview to take me on their heroine's journey so that we can see how you triumphed over and you're still like, no one ever arrives, right? Like your yeah, you're, life you're is always, there's journey, gonna be yeah. something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, so what, when you let's let's kind of back up a little bit in that journey between um you know seeing yourself in the situation of being a single mom having these children now it's kind of up to you um 
what was, and you kind of woke up to, Hey, I have this powerful spiritual gift. And I think you called it a catalyst where you're able, you recognize uh, yeah, that you were able yeah. to shift energy. I knew that before I, I, I actually went on this journey. It, it was something that was obvious to me before, but all the, all the, all the ugly bits, all the ugly mm -hmm. blocks, or whatever you call it, were highlighted when I was going to set up the business. But when you only go into, when you get a job, when you go into employment, you know your your self worth isn't that a mature question because you have already built it up based on your education and your experience and you know the feedback you get. It becomes a loop. But when you set up a business, it's all on you, right? You have right. to ask for the sale. You have to go out and get the money, and that's when all your inner inner ugliness, as I can call it, or your your wounds or your traumas are brought to surface. All your shadow sides. <laughs> yeah, your shadow side, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely, well, absolutely. I, it's the, entre the path of an entrepreneur is, um, it's a very, very rocky, thorny path. And mm -hmm. people only see the outcome or they see the failure. They either see the success or the failure and they gauge, you know, and, and everyone's, everyone's definition of success is very, very sacred very specific mm -hmm. to that person. Yeah. So yeah. some people who go into to be an entrepreneur, they're actually not trying to create wealth. A lot mm -hmm. of people I meet, it's not their intention. It's just like, I have this thing I have to do. <laughs> and yeah. if I don't do it, you know, but it's a nice side benefit if you can generate wealth through doing your soul work. And that is what I'm super passionate about. Um, Agreed. Agreed. How, and I think it's easier to create wealth when you are on your life purpose because you're, then, you, then you're never working in a day in your life. You're, you're yeah, doing what you like enjoy work. doing. Yeah, it does not feel like work. So I know that you teach um, spiritual laws of money and I've mm -hmm. read books here and there and I love Tony Robbins too, by the way. We took our three oldest kids to see Tony Robbins. We kind of had to plug their ears in a few parts, but it's all good. Um, I'm not a Tony Robbins fan. I have to say. I'm, not a, I'm not a Tony Robbins fan. I switch off, I was, he switched me off years ago. Oh, okay. He's just too well, rowdy right for me. Yeah, well, he's, he's pretty rowdy, but like he is a super powerful person. Like his he is. For sure, is for sure, for sure. So anyway, so you're you kind of decided how did you go from energy work to i'm going to help people with money like how did that how did that well come? exactly that was my thing that you know when i when i decided i was going to, i was going to help become an energy coach and do energy healing um, and I and I decided this in January of remember January 2027, um, 2027. I'm, I'm ten years ahead now. Uh, January 2017, and that's when you know everything, all my blocks were brought to surface, and I realized. So one of the biggest blocks that that I realized during that time was I had what I developed what's called, what I call toxic money, where money becomes so toxic that there's not everything I touch turns to dust, and there was you know very little that I could do, and my relationship with money was really really negative. So I went ahead, when I recognized that, and I recognized all the signs, and I came up with it, I thought, okay, oh dear, um, how do I rectify it? That's when the idea of the money avatar was born. And that, you know, money avatar came along. Now, that's not the only way that you can deal with it. Toxic money, if you have it, it's a really, really uh, dark place to be. Uh, and it takes some time for money to become toxic. Usually, it's a long process. You've been in a situation which is negative, and you know, um, in, in very short, basically, the idea is the source of your, you know, where you get the money from is very, very. Um, it's it's not good for your health. It's actually not good for your confidence. It's not good for your morale. You really load actually the the source of income that you're having. It could be a job. It could be a partner. It could be inheritance. It could be something else. Or it could be you know a, a, you know a legal battle or some sort. But the problem is you've become dependent on it. So your livelihood, your survival depends on it. So you're in a catch twenty two situation where you don't want the money where it's coming from, yet you need it to survive. Can you see how? Uh -huh. And then the more you need it, the more you hate it, and the more you get angry and money and becomes really really toxic and this is what had become with me with my ex-husband we had an awful marriage before I and mean, before he cheated i think he was cheating on he was like doing me a biggest favor ever we had a really really awful marriage and I i'm sorry i don't him. mean to laugh but that's actually really funny <laughs> <laughs> it was an awful marriage he, him him cheating on me was a favor on me i swear i wouldn't have, i never would have left him i would have died trying to make the marriage work. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um so that's why you know it's, it's it's funny when i think about it now 
but um but not funny at the time it's like traumatic oh no no of course of course at the time i had went through you know hell and back and it was very traumatic and everything but anyway the the point is money had become toxic because he was an awful person to be with and he would make me feel so small and you know and one of my biggest things by the way sherry um was uh false was i was an intelligent woman and god you should never educate a woman right how dare i be educated and be smart you know if he ever remarried again he would never marry a smart woman (laughs) (laughs) that was my biggest flaw um but anyway uh, so because of that I had to eliminate toxic money and make to- uh, money my friend. And I remember thinking about it. So this is where the idea of uh, money out was born. Well, you know, how do I make money? My, you know, how do what? How do I want money to be treated? People get, you know, and, and I hear this all the time. Money is just neutral. Money is, you know, money is nothing. Money is just a tool. And I actually think now, as I've built my, you know, my relationship with money over the last three years. I think my role as an advocate is still present. I'm still an advocate. I'm just now an advocate for money because I my biggest thing that I teach people is to become friends with money and stop blaming money for all your problems, right? And this is where you know you start you actually make an avatar of money and you become friends with it. And when you become friends with money, you know when you actually genuinely become friends with money, you no longer have need or greed for money anymore. You start treating money with love and respect, but without the greed and the need and without the you know the, the, the oh when are you going to show up but you know you know money's going to show up and if money becomes your best friend you know your best friend's going to be there to have your back whenever you need it even before you need it they just show up because they think they know more than you do but they need you you know you need them if you're upset they're there if you are in trouble they're there that's the whole point of a best friend do you see what i mean and this is where the I, idea of money avatar was born i think that we are so programmed growing up i mean i i grew up in pretty much poverty, but I, I, I just, I didn't never felt like I had amazing parents who worked really mm-hmm. hard, but, um, it's like, we had a lot of kids and, you know, it was just a different time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I always just told myself that, and, and I, my listeners know the story, but like, um, I'm the second oldest of seven children and, mm-hmm. um, I, my mother is beautiful and she was always a stay at home mom. My dad was a police officer and, I remember when I was in like fifth grade, my mom took my sis, my older sister and I to the high school after it, like at night, after like all of, all the, you know, sports practices and everything were over and we cleaned the bathrooms. Um, I remember just looking at my mom going, uh, this is, my mother's not born to clean bathrooms, Uh, you know, and I'm not either. And I just, there was something with that experience that I just kind of like locked that in. And I was like, no, I, I want to make money when I get older. I, yeah. I want, to, this is my birthright. And anyway, as I, as I've grown and as I've, you know, gotten into business and traveled in different things, I've, I've just met a lot of hungry women who, who are starting to claim exactly kind of what you're talking about. It's just this yeah. idea of why, why do I have such a combative relationship with money, you know, and, a lot of it is early programming. A lot of it is from um, some of the religious programming we got. Some of it is cultural. Some of it is from our families. Um, my grandparents were in the Great Depression, and my parents, you know, scrimped and saved. And I just always, I always kind of got the message like that if the less you have, that kind of the more simple you are, whatever, the happier mm-hmm. you are. And that's kind of a paradox because it's not completely true for everyone. Yeah. Some people may have a path to live maybe a super simple, maybe monastic life, like a pauper or something, and they'll be totally happy as a clam. I'm not built that way. Yeah. And um, I had to claim my own authenticity with resources and, and what I wanted to create, what I personally wanted to create. Um, and I have big dreams to create a healing center and all these things. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, if I want to do that, if you're going to give money, you have to have it. You know, the more you have, the more you can give. Yeah, absolutely. So what are, what are your spiritual laws of money? What are the, the ones that you teach? Well, pretty much all the laws, all the spiritual laws of money. And one of the, one of the biggest ones that I've recently spoken about is um, the law of patience. So you, you know, about, you know, when you create, you know, that's, you know, one of the biggest missing pieces that I found. And especially, I think I did this on my episode 50 on my, my podcast. It was just, it was spontaneous because one of my friends and she's amazing, like really, really amazing, not a client, a friend. And, uh, and, and you, you probably know this, Sheree, it's easier to coach clients than it is friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> And so, yeah, it doesn't matter what I say, she, she just doesn't take heed. And, and 
with her, we had this, she's been, you know, she's been trying to create this, this business and with it, you know, for, for quite some time now. And she's become really, really impatient. And the more impatient she's become, the more, the more, you know, troubles have come along. You know, this client cancelled and this issue became along and that issue came with the, uh, with the bank. And she's like, why are all these issues coming? And I keep telling her, you need to clear your energy. You need to stop, you know, you, know, you need to be patient that things will work out in the worst way possible. But, but she, was, she highlighted the fact that it's very common most of the time, the problem people have is they, they want to create something, but they want it now. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that whatever the desire is already present in the universal, um, in the um, in the spiritual, also, you know, in the spiritual uh, world, you know, or you can call it quantum field, whichever way you call it, it's the same thing. It's just a scientific word is quantum field and spiritual one is spiritual world, right? Same thing. And... This is this is one of the laws. Um, if you but the problem is the the less patient you are, the more impatient you are, the further away you push away that the you know the way we desire into the spiritual world. So that's one of the laws. Second one is the law of vacuum. So you know if you want something in your life, you need to make space for it, right? Um, so that uh, that's that's especially true you know when, when i when i talk about decluttering like if you want if you've got de- if you've got clutter you need to create vacuum so you can you know, create a better space you need to make space and then replace it with a new energy so this is something that i apply quite extensively in my energy clearings i make space for new positive energy in your energy space so we use energy i want my my own personal modality to actually cleanse your energy so we've created space and that's what i call the negative round we have a 36 a second break in between and then i actually put in because once you create the space once you we've once you wiped your slate clean so to speak then we actually add in the positive energy by using the law of vacuum because you know you can only uh, the universe can only come and fill something in if there's space for it and we put in the you know we put in the positive energy and we're able to do that now if your cup is full where are you going to fill it you can't. And a lot of people are walking around with really negative energy and they can't put positive thing energy on. And I know, I know there's some, you know, some amazing um, gurus and some amazing um, teachers who say, well, if, the, if it's dark, turn the light on. I'm, I always say, well, how the hell am I going to turn the light on if I can't even figure out where the light switch is, right? So the first thing to do is to cleanse your energy. So that's an, another one of the spiritual laws of money, which is um, using the law of vacuum. And there are many more like laws of So all the, the spiritual laws of money are the spiritual laws of which are universal laws, which are applicable across the board. So you can you, you can pick any of those up and you'll find there is a relevance to that um, which has a direct impact on your wealth. Does it make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, nature yeah, nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why. But but you have to create the vacuum first if you want to, you know, if you want something different. Now I know that um so this is the, the law of vacuum is, was first introduced to me by Brock Pocter. I love Brock Pocter. Mm-hmm. And I and he did it for basic things like if you want new curtains, get rid of your old ones. If you need if you want new surface, get rid of your surface and you know, make space in your cupboard and so forth. But I've used that principle in energy as well. If you want better energy, cleanse your old energy. You need to cleanse it. You need to get cut cords with people. You need to, that's another thing. If you want better relationships, you need to declutter your, your current relationships and you need to cut cords with people in your life at the moment because if your space is occupied by people who are not beneficial for your energy and they're corded into you, you're going to have very difficult, a lot of difficulty attracting new higher vibrational people as friends or colleagues or clients because you're clogged up with all the people. Again, cut cords. Um, so that's another thing and technique I teach quite extensively, cutting cords. And cleanse your space of the, the ne- low vibrational people so you have space um, for, for new people to show up. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. You have to clear it. Uh, it's, if you have all these attachments energetically, then it's really hard for what wants to find you to attach to you <laughs> yeah exactly so i mean that 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 works in so many so many areas not just um so, not just relationships yeah. yeah absolutely so patience and a vacuum and and what else okay so what other laws we can talk about um another one is law of, um, that i talk about is the law of words your words are very very powerful and this is where affirmations come in now a lot of people talk about affirmations but uh, you know i think the the movie the secret sort of gave this distorted idea that you all you have to do is just chant affirmations all day and things will fall into your lap which doesn't actually work how because it, you know it's it, uh, affirmations are one piece of the puzzle but they are a very important piece so the law of words states that you know if you are creating your reality by speaking your reality you can actually create it so the law of words is a very, very important one but you have to choose 
choose your words, not just consciously, but subconsciously also. Most people who try to use a lot of words by, you know, saying these affirmations, they're using the words consciously that's it so they may say affirmations first thing in the morning for about maybe under 15 20 minutes and then maybe last thing at night for 15 20 minutes and then throughout the day they just forget about it and they're actually subconsciously saying them to themselves the negative to the chatter the opposite so they're using the law of word against themselves however if they if they can use the law of word in their favor by using certain techniques especially again energy clearing cleanse the energy first and changing the way they talk to themselves they can use the law of word for for themselves and to create basically speak the reality that they desire make sense yes yeah words are i just was talking about this on a very recent podcast that um in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so mm-hmm. when we want to speak something into creation we use the power of words um i think that's a lot of that the neurolinguistic programming that you were pro- that you were trained in i think i've nlp yeah yeah i've done i've done a little bit of work with that i mean just minimal but i have a, uh, that's what I took from that is our <laughs> words are so powerful. Um, okay. So patience and clearing out the vacuum and then the words. Awesome. I mean, then we, we can go, <laughs> I've got, I've written, uh, I'm, I'm currently writing the book on this, which is called the laws of money. Um, and so that would be coming out hopefully by, you know, in early part of next year. And uh, you know, that, that's where I extensively go on all the different laws that, that are important and how to apply them and how, how people are u- misusing them against themselves. So a lot of people, when they say, oh, the law of attraction is working, I always say, uh, the law of attraction cannot stop working. It's like the law of gravity. It doesn't stop working just because you don't use it on the <laughs> yeah. right? It's always there. But you're using the law of attraction against yourself. So you're creating things that you don't desire because you're, you, you're in the habit of, of doing things, be the negative chitter chatter or the, um, you know, or suppression of oh, there's another one that's the suppression of emotions the the bottom line is sherry what we need to do is through all these different pra- practices and modalities what in in truth we're creating is emotional memory that you need to create now so unfortunately the subconscious mind does not understand thought past pre- present and future it just understands now so if you think that you don't have it then you don't have it if you think you'll have it in the future you still don't have it you need to make your subconscious mind think that you have it or you you know energy to believe that you have it and that's why you need to be creating subconscious memories of the, the thing you desire and this is what most people fail at. And this is why, you know, because they're, they're chanting and then, you know, pointless or emotionless affirmations, they're still creating what they don't desire. Whereas if they started working actively and using affirmations as part of it and using, you know, using a lot of words in, in their favor, but actively cre- started creating emotional memory for the things that desire, for example, the business, the, the future partner, the health, the, 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 the sum of money, then what they'll find is the stronger the emotional memory of what it, of whatever it is the desire, the faster it will show up in the 3D world. Mm-hmm. That's, if I can give you a grand sort of understanding of how the law of attraction works, that is it. And this is a missing piece because people think they can join affirmations and it will happen. And what you're after is not endless chanting affirmations or vision boards and what have you. It's actually creation of an emotional memory of what you desire being here with you right now. Mm. I love that. And it it all comes back to just that present moment awareness and just kind of the power of now, the whole Eckhart Tolle thing, you know, when when all we really have is now, everything else is an illusion. And I love, I love how you, put that together about creating subconscious memories and the stronger that that we can create the emotional attachment to that or the desire and fostering that and the the quicker and more powerfully it will come yeah absolutely okay well cool so i know you um you do a lot of training with changing our energy relationship with money we kind of talked a little bit about that um I just, I'm really interested on your take of how you believe that money is spiritual for those people who might be struggling to kind of bridge over from like, you know, there's just a lot, maybe there's a lot of emotional charge. Maybe there's a lot of baggage with money. Maybe they feel like they failed at creating money or what have Mm -hmm. you. Um, or there's that, or there's also like money's evil. It's this, it's that it's, you know, um, 
It doesn't grow on trees, all those things we heard growing up, right? Yeah. The stories I mean, we carry. So money, we all know money is energy, like everything else energy. So if I give you the three core principles of 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 the universe is one everything is energy including you you know the sound of my voice my hair my you know my thoughts ideas everything and that includes money and the principle number two is that everything then vibrates on a particular frequency that has to be by law that's the next uh, then that's the next principle and that includes money and the third principle is that whatever you are in, you know, you attract to you, whatever you are in harmony with on that particular frequency and that includes money. So if you can raise your vibration to a level of, of money, then you can't help but attract it. Money has no choice where it goes. It'll go to a killer as, as, as quick as we'll go to a saint. It doesn't have a choice in which where it goes is how you, you know, how you attract it. Now, the best way that I can advise someone to, you know, to change their ideology and, um, and, and change the mindset around money is through the use of money avatar. Now, I've, I've given this before, and we can try this now if you if you if you if up for it, my darling. Sure. Um, and so, if you close your eyes for a moment, and I want you to picture someone, who, you know, someone who'd be your ideal best friend. So nobody you know, nobody from TV, nobody from movies, no one like that. Okay, no animal. And I, I, you know, it, it, it can be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to look like a human. It, it hasn't have to be human, but you know, it can be humanoid. But it has to have a human form. It could be a humanoid, like it could be, you know, that like we see movie, in movies, humanoids and the aliens, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but it has to be humanoid. Okay, there's a purpose, there's a reason for that. Now, I want you to see your ideal best friend, male, female, age, hair color, eye color. Okay. What would they do professionally? You know, what are they? You know, what kind of interests they have? What kind of personality traits do they have? So, what does this individual who is your ideal best friend look like? Behave like? Sound like? Right? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to What's say it or not? No, 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 no. Just, no. Just keep it in your mind. Just keep it in mind. Be very clear. So I want to get. To, I want you to have such a clear, vivid image of this person that you know. That if I if I did ask you, you can tell me exactly what color is her hair. Is it you know different shades of blonde, or is it you know is it a mixture of a gold golden highlights or brunette or whatever? You know, it, you know what color is her skin? Is it medium? Is it tan? Is it you know is she slim build? Are you with me? You get mm -hmm. get a very very clear image of who this person is. Now once you have, and this has to be your best friend, someone who's going to be your absolute best friend, and this is why you make this person up, like your imaginary best friend. Now, once you have this image, this is your money avatar. Give it a name. Mm -hmm. My money avatar is Michelle, but you give your, you know, give um, your money avatar a name. Now, now, this is the first time you're going to be meeting her. Now, I take a, this is, I've just done this very quickly, but normally in my workshops, I had, there's a set process that I take you through and I, I sort of lower your brainwaves to alpha brainwaves, which is, you know, when you're more receptive to communication. And then I introduce you to my avatar and then I allow you to have a conversation with him or her. And what you find is, through whatever you hear your, the money avatar say, you can, that's your subconscious mind speaking to you, telling you what is your current status with your money avatar. And my homework for people usually is, now that you have your money avatar, become friends with him or her. You won't be friends with her or instantly, it takes time to build a relationship. You may really like someone when you first time, when you meet them for the first time, but for you to become friends, it will take time. You have to build that relationship. And that means having conversations with your money, money avatar every evening. If you have a best friend, you'll give them a call every evening just to check in, like, how are you doing, man, you know, whatever and so forth as you build your relationship you'll start seeing money in a different light now if you have a best friend do you you know if they come over to your house do you lock them in a room and throw away the key <laughs> hell no right you, you, you they probably never turn up to you again so why do you want to lock money away as soon as it comes so you understand the ebb and flow of money same way with your best friend your best friend will come and go as and when he or she pleases but the stronger the bond with you the the more expectation you know that you have that oh it's okay you know you're going that's fine I'll, you know i'm gonna miss you but i'll see you soon you know they're gonna come back they're your best friend of course they're gonna come back and more importantly because you, most people are not concerned with ebb and flow of money they're concerned with oh i need it money doesn't show up when you become best friends with money you become you become you know accustomed to the idea that doesn't matter what happens, money is going to show up before you need it because you know money is your best friend. So money is always going to be there even before you know you need it. 
-hmm. It's always there. It's got your back. And as slowly and gradually, as you build your relationship with money, you find money stands up more and more black and white in your bank account, in your wallet, in your energy. And the way you feel about money begins to change. And then you no longer have like, oh, please come, please come, please come. The needy and, you know, the really greedy or greedy or needy energy, (laughs) the desperate energy. You're like, oh, okay, you're coming. Oh, great. So every time you're paying a bill, every time you're doing something, you're doing it with the love. Like, oh, you know, thank you so much. I have, you know, for being my life. I can, you know, for example, you know, they they teach you, you know, I know all the big chorus to talk about saying, you know, blessing your bills and so forth. And I truly think that's a great idea as well. When you pay your utility bills or your other bills, or especially business bills, be so grateful that you have the money to pay those bills but also expect thank you so much money for being here i you know i know you're going but you're, i know you're going to come back that is the idea that needs to sink into your subconscious mind the money is your best friend it's always going to be there before you know you need it has always got your back and it's always coming and the stronger you bond you build with your best friend guess what you start hanging out more you go more to you know whatever you like doing if you like going abseiling or hiking or walking you, you hang out with each other more and more and more and that's where you find the money more and more shows up and comes and stays in your bank accounts, in your wallet, in your energy, and your business begins to grow. And you think, oh, I'm doing the same thing. Does it make sense? This is like kind of what I'm hearing is it's like a, a comfortability, like a familiarity between yeah. instead of this polarizing, like, oh, you know, you haven't been good to me, money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you haven't, you haven't yeah. been my friend. You betrayed me. What's up? Yeah. I mean, I, if I give you another example, the reason why most people, you know, when people, most people think, well, how does that work? And I'll, I'll say, okay, if you think about it, if your money is just energy and money is energy, like you and I, and then we are, you know, if you, for example, Sherry, if you and I go to, say um you know we go to a party and there's a really hot guy who comes along and we both look at him and (laughs) we think oh my god he's so sexy he's so hot right and then under our breath we both think well he must be so arrogant he must be so this and he must be a narcissistic and this this and we have we're sending all these negative vibes to the poor bloke right how likely is he to come and chat to us (laughs) unlikely right we don't have to even say to his face or we look at him when we say this and subconsciously he'll pick up our negative vibes and he wouldn't bother looking at us let alone approach us okay so why is money any different why doesn't you know if you are blaming money for everything that's going wrong in your life if you blame money for every time your business goes down or someone betrays you or whatever happens and all your frustrations always end up you know talking <laughs> blaming poor money then why would money want to be, you know, uh, why would it show, want it to show up in the first place? And if for some reason, you know, you're able to provide a good ser- a product or a service, because a lot of people actually are able to create money, they're not, they're not able to keep money. They're not able to keep money for this reason, because even though they provide a great product or service and people want to give them money, money comes, but money doesn't like your energy and money doesn't like your anger and frustration against it. So it leaves very quickly. Logically, of course, you know, a bill comes up or a client doesn't pay or something else happens. It's the very logical reasons, but spiritually, that's why money doesn't stay. And that's why money leaves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like why would he, why would that resource want to hang around if there isn't? No. <laughs> no. Oh man. Well, I feel like we could just keep going and going and going. Um, there's so much, and this is just, again, I, this is really bad use of words probably, but there's a wealth of information out there. Yeah. We've got, like yeah. there's, it's, there's depth to this topic. Um, yeah. and I think that that's another misconception people have is there's superficiality about trying to source abundance and money. And it's, it's for me, it's been a spiritual journey. Yeah. I mean, I always say this, okay, how can you possibly reach your greatest heights if you don't have abundant money? Because if you're still, you know, trapped in the nine to five and worried about how you're going to pay the bill, how you're going to pay the rent and the mortgage and whatever, and stuck in the stress and that's that's frustrating, frustrating situation. How are you actually going to allow yourself to read, to go and see nature, to be able to explore life, to be able to have good food, to be able to have good health, to be able to explore this physical life that, that's, that's a gift from God? I always say we, we are here for such a finite period of time. We're not here forever. We're here for 80, 90, 100 years max. And we are these spiritual beings who have decided to come and have a physical experience. And we're using our physical bodies to experience the physical world. I mean, we were spiritual beings in the beginning. We're spiritual beings in the uh, you know, during and we be spiritual beings after only during this finite period can we experience this physical world 
Why do you not want to see the, you know, see it in, in its totality? Why do you not want to grow to the greatest heights? Why do you want to explore what talents and abilities you have? Why do you want to go and leave a legacy behind? And all of these require money. The first thing you need to do in order to create any kind of, you know, um, you know, any kind of wealth in your life, I mean, wealth of, um, not just financial wealth, but wealth in terms of your health, wealth in your relationships, wealth in everything, and wealth in your time, because time is finite, by the way, that you need to make sure that money is, it becomes a non-issue. Money is always there. So that you, you have the time freedom to create the life of your dreams and experience this physical world in its totality. Make sense? Mm. Yes. And I feel like that's just a beautiful way to kind of wrap this up because that really says it all. <laughs> we have one shot and um, I don't know. I just love the concept of abundant living on all levels. Yes. And indeed. it's not about the acquisition of things. It's about being able to manage energy. And that includes your personal energy, but it also includes your relationships because all relationships are an energy exchange, as you know. Like, yeah. Um, and so money is that neutral. It in and of itself, it's just paper and coins and whatever. I mean, it's just a neutral thing, a number. Mm. Um, and so clearing up our perception of what we're attaching to that money as that benign resource seemingly yeah. um, has been a real conscious journey for me. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think like you were saying at the beginning with the patience part, you know, there's a season for under you know clearing your money issues and understanding how this exchange happens and and then sort of fine tuning how it speaks to you for lack of a better um mm -hmm. it feels like there's a call for some people to maybe um produce more wealth so that it because it could be tied into their mission or through humanitarian or other means, but I've just, I've really tracked a lot of people who've been successful that way. And it's really fascinating to me. Um, and there are some people who are very, very wealthy and they don't acquire a lot of material goods. So you would never know. Um, I, I literally know people who give away over half of their income. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just interesting how we all have, and I don't think we need to judge anything as right or wrong, right? I guess that's kind of where I want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> because again, that, that's, that's us putting our perception on someone else's relationship to money when we yeah. judge what they're doing with it or not doing yeah. with it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, who are we to decide what's right and wrong for somebody else? I say this all the time, make money, but you know, and, and at least be comfortable with it. But what's comfortable for you is very subjective to you. What's comfortable to me is very subjective for me. Somebody could be happy making five thousand a month, and somebody else could, you know, could be, you know, happy making fifty thousand a month. It's very subjective. What kind of money is, makes comfortable for you, and what you want to do with it. It's entirely your choice. But at least give yourself the ability to have that choice. Mm -hmm. And that's come. And that's freedom, right? Yeah, and that's freedom. And that is true freedom. Money is something that you can make easily. Unfortunately, time in this physical realm, in this 3D world, is not something we can get back. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Gull. This has just been so fascinating. How do our listeners find you? And that's great. I have my own podcast. If you enjoy talking, listening to me um, about all the different uh, areas of money, I have a, a podcast that I'm absolutely passionate about, and that's called Money Mindset with Gold Khan, and we're available, available everywhere. And then I also have a website, which is goldkhan.com. Oh, beautiful. Well, thank you for being a guest. This has just been really interesting to me. I've been taking notes, and just a lot of this was just a refresher for me. To, I just need to clear some more things out because mm -hmm. we're and I don't know if you noticed this too and then we'll wrap up but what my vision was five years ago I feel like it's expanding of course. and so I need to change my vibration to match that expansion and I've Agreed. been resisting it a little bit and so having this conversation with you has really um, validated that for me or just kind of woke me up again so I just oh, want to honor you for that <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> all right so I guess the take home message here is to just make friends <laughs> make friends with this neutral resource of money give it or her a name 
make it or her a best friend. Not seeing it as the enemy or something that doesn't come to you easily. Just creating those subconscious memories of what you desire and being able to receive, being in a state of openness, which is what the feminine is all about. Everything is energy. Everything vibrates at a certain frequency. You must be a match. Your frequency must be a match of the frequency of the thing that you desire. So creating this positive charge with receiving, uh, not in a materialistic vein or greedy way, but the new way of being, the feminine way of wealth. Again, just a reminder to come into the Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group and ask to join. And of course, our wonderful guest today, Gull Khan. You can find her on www.gullkhan.com.